I would have been here on time, except I was standing in the middle of the street waiting for one of our honored guests, Dr. Barbara Bundy, who's sitting here in the audience. For you who are not as old as I am, Barbara found this center. Not only found it, she made it. One person, one office, one phone, and she stormed the city, raised money, and when she left us, she left us a great hole, but we continue to try and fill some of her space. She also has with her a guest tonight who has been very helpful to the University of San Francisco and to the center in particular, Dr. Peter Coughlin. Peter has just escaped from the London Olympics, and he looks not the less for wear. My London friend said, you should have come this summer, that central London was deserted. It was only out in the old East End, where I've never gone because I was told not to go there, that now it's been splendidly redone so that you can go to even the East End of London. So enough on those formalities. We are going to have a faculty here in a moment. It's, we teach a lot in the evening, as my two colleagues up front know. And Shalendra Sharma is right now trying to conclude a class so he can run over here. But I have never been at a loss, even when Sharon Stone was here, I was able to control things. Some of you might not know that we brought her here because she knows the Dalai Lama, and don't ask how. So the point is, we have a wonderful guest with us. He has done everything. He's taught in China, has his own China blog. He took our Masters in Asian Pacific Studies. He has since gone on to UCLA. He has won his PhD down there, and he's written a book all in one lifetime. Greg is a scholar and a gentleman, and he wants to give us a picture tour through China. I think his thesis, I could get it wrong, is that they're going to become the Detroit of the future so that you pay attention to their push in the auto field. But join me in welcoming Greg. Come up, don't be shy. Get your mic, turn it on. Even a UCLA person can do this. I'm going to leave you all alone up here. Okay. You start talking. When Sharma gets here, I will boot him up front. Okay. All right? Ciao. Okay. Speak into the mic loud. The mic. Okay. Is this good? Can everyone hear me? Thank you so much. I've, I was just thinking about this. I've actually known Pat for 20 years now. <laughs> um, I first met him when I was doing my MBA at Golden Gate University, well, 20 years ago, um, at the Silicon Valley campus. And uh, he was teaching a course on ethics. And so since then, we've, well, we, we, we were out of touch for a bit. And then one day, he showed up here at USF while I was doing my MA in Asia Pacific Studies. And uh, so since then, we've remained in touch. And so it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be back um, to see Pat and Barbara and Yildiz Cruz and Professor Sharma when he arrives, um, and some other familiar faces, and Ken. Um, so it's, it's a real pleasure for me to be back here. I feel like USF is sort of an intellectual home for me, and it was, it was here that I first got the idea that I could even become some sort of a scholar, um, even attempt a PhD. And I remember sitting down and having conversations with my professors here um, in preparation for that. And so it sort of started here. So tonight I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that I've done on China's auto industry. And um, this is what you're going to see is just is abbreviated from a much longer talk that goes on for about 12 hours. Um, it, no, just kidding. <laughs> the, the longer talk is about 45 minutes, but I've tried to shorten it a bit to maybe 20 minutes tonight, and then we'll have uh, some conversation. Um, the the first thing I want to really say here is I, 
the research here started with a, a really simple question for me. I was observing China. I've, I've been sort of following China, I guess, really since 1989, when it started to appear on TVs here in the West um, for the first time. It sort of became front and center. So since that time, I've been aware of China. Um, went to live in China in 1994 and lived there for a couple of years. But one thing about China that had always confounded me was you know, living here in the West, we get a very heavy dose of neoclassical economics, even if we don't know that's what it's called. It's just basically the story that, um, you know, free markets, capitalism, uh, minimal regulation, low taxes, um, minimal government involvement in the economy, and uh, to the degree that the government gets involved in the economy, that's a bad thing because the private sector can do it better. It can do it faster, more efficiently, more t productively. Um, but then we have this example of China that is sort of becomes the elephant in the room. If government involvement in the economy is such a bad thing, how come China is doing so well with this model? And how come they've been doing so well for so long, despite the number of people who continue to predict some kind of a collapse? That was the question that really drove me to, at least to begin my research. And so I, I chose a single industry because I wanted to dive deeply in one industry and just figure out how industrial planning worked from the top to the bottom. And I spent um, all together combined about a year in China interviewing people, um, some in English, some in Chinese, uh, conducting a very thorough uh, analysis of the Chinese literature <clears throat> on planning and on the, the auto industry itself. And basically, to sort of tell you what the answer is, at least that I have found for now, is that while, yes, China's model has been extremely effective in taking China from being a poor country to being a middle-class country or a middle-income country, it's starting to lose its effectiveness. That brings into question whether China can continue to use the same model going from middle-income to being advanced. And so that's sort of the, that is the conclusion that I draw um, from this research. Um, now, what do we mean by the, the model is effective? Well, the, the model has clearly been effective in, in terms of growing China's economy, going from, um, from a very poor economy and then for about 30 years turning in 10% GDP growth on average for 30 years. That's just, that's unprecedented, that's astounding. And so there's no question that China's been successful. So these, these first few slides will just illustrate kind of the magnitude of it. Now, I'm, I'm going to be talking more specifically about the auto industry here, but keep in mind the, the question I'm asking is, is to, to try to get at what drives model, China's model as a whole. But here with the auto industry, we can see um, the growth of China compared to the United States. Um, in 2009, China's auto industry, in terms of, of units sold, went um, for the first time above the U.S. And then in 2010, China's uh, growth in autos was above anything the U.S. had ever achieved before, even at its peak, and it has remained so. So it, the China's auto industry was about 18 and a half million vehicles sold last year alone, um, and it's on pace to, to beat that again this year. Um, They've made some progress toward consolidation. Now, why is this important? Consolidation is about having fewer but larger enterprises. If it's fragmented, if it's all spread out among a bunch of small enterprises, they would never be able to compete against the much larger foreign uh, companies like General Motors and Toyota and so forth. Um, so as you can see here, just the combined top five companies' market shares of the United States and China compared, China is actually slightly more consolidated than the United States when you look at it this way. And even China's largest company um, has a larger market share than the largest in the U.S. The largest in the U.S. is General Motors, of course. Um, China, that's Shanghai Auto, which happens to be the partner of General Motors in, in China. Now, I just told you, I just showed you the same chart and told you it was consolidated. Now I'm telling you it's fragmented that's what you see when you start to look below. So the United States, 100% of the market 
is comprised of 24 companies. And these are all companies you've heard of, from General Motors at the top, Toyota, Honda, uh, Chrysler, Ford. Down at the bottom, you've got the smaller players, Suzuki, uh, Hyundai, Mercedes, Audi. Um, I, even Tesla, I think, would be in that list, um, if you have heard of that company. So how many are in China's market? 115. So that is sort of the definition of fragmentation. You've got 115 players. Um, most of these have such small market share, um, it's not even measurable. Many of these are unprofitable, they're inefficient, they're run by local governments. Uh, some of them may even turn out 50, 100 cars a year, uh, some of them in the thousands, but they're just small and unprofitable. And it's a, it's a huge waste of resources. So in a sense, what you've got here is you've got a, a bifurcated industry. You've got two different auto industries. You've got the auto industry up at the top, the five to ten, maybe top dozen companies that are consolidating and getting big and beginning to reach a state where they could compete against other auto companies. But then you've got this mass down at the bottom that are a real drag on efficiency and should essentially disappear. Now, part of what is coming, uh, a part of, the, part of the effect of this is Chinese brands are, are really falling short. Why is this important? Who cares about the brand on the car? What difference does it make? Well, it makes a difference because the brand determines who gets the money. That's where the royalties go. So whoever, gets, whoever has their brand on the car is going to get most of the money from the car being sold. In China, um, about 30% of the market now is Chinese branded cars, and that's actually down slightly from 2010. Year to date this year, Chinese branded cars have already lost about 3% of that market. That's actually pretty significant because one of the chief goals of, of Beijing is for Chinese automakers to at least dominate in their own market. The trend is not working in their favor. Now, why is that? Um, there's a few reasons for that, and let me, uh, let me just mention this as well. Part of the reason that, uh, that the brands aren't working well is Chinese automakers are very hev heavily dependent on foreign design and technology. And I'll get into the reasons why they're dependent on that in just a few minutes. But it leads to things like this, just this sort of copying. Um, on the left, you have the familiar to Toyota logo you've seen. On the right is a logo of uh, Geely, a, a private Chinese automaker. Um, they figured, well, it's, let's make something that looks sort of like the Toyota logo. Um, Toyota sued Geely in a Chinese court and lost. The judge said, this Toyota logo is not a well-known logo that deserves protection, protection in China, which was a signal to Chinese automakers that copy at will. It, it's open season. And so they did. And so you get, um, Geely also makes a car that looks a lot like a Mercedes. Um, Beijing Jeep, um, or Beijing, the Beijing Auto Company is making one that looks very much like the Jeep Cherokee. Um, spitting image here of a Toyota Yaris made by Great Wall. Um, even, at least the logo is different. Um, and this company out in Chongqing called Li Fan makes a Mini Cooper knockoff, a very, a very good copy of the, the Mini Cooper. Um, now, this is, this is kind of amusing, but if you think about this from China's point of view, the Chinese are, know, know their history pretty well. And they know that around the time of the Industrial Revolution, the Germans began to copy what the British were doing. And the British weren't happy about that. And there was nothing they could do about it. And eventually, the Americans came along and start, started copying the Germans and the British. And then the Japanese eventually came along and started copying the Americans and the Germans and the British. Now the Chinese have just gotten in line. They're just doing what everybody else did who came before. And so it's, it's, it's probably a bit baffling to the Chinese why foreigners are so upset about intellectual property rights. But they kind of get it because they've signed on to robust institutions like the WTO that is intended to protect uh, property rights. So they at least want to be seen to trying to follow the rules a bit. 
At the same time, they can't help themselves but try to copy the, the examples of what came before. Now, part of this is also cultural, and, I, and I'm sure you've heard some of these, this explanation as well. Um, uh, art in China, um, what many artists begin by doing is to copy what the masters did before them. Um, so it's sort of a way of learning. And so from the Chinese perspective, foreigners have sort of climbed up on the roof and then kicked away, tried to kick away the ladder. You guys got rich by copying each other, and we're just trying to do what you did. So there is some reasoning behind that. Um, before, I, before I talk about this, I, I've had to rearrange my slides just a little bit tonight. Um, before I talk about that, I, I want to sort of get into some of the reasons that, um, that China's brands are not dominating even in their own market and some of the reasons that we have a lot of these small uh, automakers that continue to exist in China that are a drag and a waste of resources. What this comes down to is basically incentives. And there's a big difference in incentives between how a state-owned enterprise operates in China and how a private enterprise operates in China. The leaders of state-owned enterprises are, these are essentially political positions. Many of the leaders of these SOEs, state-owned enterprises, will come from a political job to work in a state-owned enterprise and then work there a few years and then later go to a different political job. And all the while, they're trying to sort of climb the ladder and get to a higher position. They're like anyone who wants to improve their situation in life, have more power, get their hands on more resources. And so when someone comes to run a state-owned enterprise, he or she, although I think they've all been he so far, um, may have come from, say, a position as a mayor of a city, uh, maybe even a vice governor or something like that. So they don't necessarily bring with them a huge background in engineering, although they may have studied as an engineer, but they may not have had a, a very big uh, role as a, an engineer in an auto company prior to that. And so their, their thinking is quite different from that of a private sector business leader. They're thinking about how do I get to my next position, which if I do well could be maybe a vice governor of the province or a governor or maybe even vice minister. Um, today the, the Minister of Industry, is it Minister of Industry and Information Technology in, uh, in Beijing, Miao Wei, used to be the CEO of Dongfeng Motors in China, which is the second largest automaker. So his career path is sort of typical. But the thing about the political career path in China is they tend to run on a five-year cycle. So between party congresses, there's five years from party congress to party congress. What that does to someone who's looking to their next job five years hence is they're thinking, what can I do in the next five years, just this five years ahead of me, what can I do to get my next job? And that doesn't involve any kind of investment that's going to pay off five years down the road because that only helps the next guy. Well, an auto company needs investment. It needs huge investment. Just to develop a single model of automobile costs about a billion dollars. So it requires a tremendous amount of money flowing into their research and development pipeline. But the leaders of state-owned enterprises are more concerned about how can I get to the next job um, I don't want to risk a lot of money. Um, they're, they sort of have blinders on. They really don't care what happens five years and further down the road. They're really only, only interested in just that five-year tenure they're going to have. So it makes them uh, very short-term uh, oriented, gives them a short investment horizon, makes them very risk-averse. What about private companies? Well, there are private automakers in China. In fact, last year, um, you, you don't see them on the list that I had, but numbers uh, 9, 10, and 11 were privately owned. That's uh, Great Wall, Geely, and BYD. You may have heard of some of these companies. They're privately owned, and they're right in there competing with the big SOEs, which is a good thing. It's good that Beijing has allowed them to compete, but they don't exactly give them the same access to resources and to funding that they give the big SOEs. The great thing about these private companies, though, is 
the leaders of these private companies have the same set of incentives as you would expect of any private company. They want to win. And so they are accustomed to taking risks. These guys are entrepreneurs. They've dared to go head to head with the state, which, which makes them people who aren't risk averse at all. In fact, they are apparently people who willingly seek the risk. And so they're willing to invest for the long term. They have the incentive to. They have to. If they don't develop their own models of cars, um, even if, let's be honest, um, some of the cars they have developed are just taken from copying foreign models, but still, it takes time and effort and money to do that kind of work. So you've got state-owned enterprises that are getting the big funding and the big support from Beijing, but who lack the, re the kinds of incentives to build Chinese-branded cars. But you've got the private companies who have every incentive in the world to build Chinese-branded cars, but are being starved of funds from the center and are having to compete against companies who have basically bottomless pockets. So that's part of the reason why that you see Chinese-branded cars are not even succeeded, succeeding in the Chinese market. Part of the other reason is Chinese consumers also overwhelmingly believe that foreign branded cars are of higher quality. And while that is true to a degree, the Chinese automakers are closing the gap. They're slowly closing the gap. Um, it's simply a matter of time before they are able to convince Chinese consumers that um, Chinese cars are of comparable quality. Um, so that's, that's the big reason that we see that the Chinese are unable to dominate even in their own market. So now the, the subtitle of my book is How China Plans to Dominate the Global Auto Industry, which is essentially sort of a play on words. It's how they plan. But this gets to sort of the, my thesis I stated at the beginning, which is the fact that the model, as it stands, did a great job of getting China where they are. But the model, as it stands, is not going to get China where it wants to be. And this is a fundamentally political issue for China. The dominance of the state in the economy is not really an economic issue, it's a political issue. Because it has to do with this overarching goal, which is regime survival. If you look at Japan and Korea and how they developed their auto industries, first of all, they were driven by governments who were single-mindedly focused on economic development. China has never been single-mindedly focused on economic development. And the reason is China's overarching goal of regime survival has outranked everything else as a goal. So secondary to that are goals like economic development and, of course, social stability. But you see repeatedly when push comes to shove, social stability will win over economic de development. And this is illustrated by the fact that those 100 or so small auto companies, which I mentioned, which were at the bottom of the list, that's why those guys still exist. They are supported by local governments that have the same kinds of incentives as the leaders of SOEs. They're looking at their next job five years down the road. How do they get their next job? Growing the economy and maintaining social stability. An auto company is a, a wonderful source of both of these things because even if the company is losing money, as long as, it's, as long as it's selling cars, that's economic growth. That counts toward GDP in the local region. And they employ people. So they're killing two birds with one stone there. Economic growth, social stability. So that's why you see a lot of these uh, small companies. Now, why can't Beijing just wave its hand and say, close all these tiny companies? You know, it's a waste, it's a drag on resources. Just let's just, just close them. A lot of people would look at that and say, well, that's because the central government can't get what it wants. It's devolved a lot of power to the local regions, and they're able to just do what they want and, uh, and just forget what Beijing wants. Well, actually, they're doing what Beijing wants because among these two primary goals of economic development and social stability, of these two, the one that better supports regime survival, and that's by that I mean the continued rule of the, the Chinese Communist Party, is social stability. 
And so by waving its hand as it could, Beijing could say, close all of these. It doesn't do so because, well, when you start to look at it, there are about 250,000 people employed in these small auto companies. And they buy components from a lot of other automakers, uh, a lot of other components makers who also employ a few hundred thousand people. But if you want to extend that, we see the same situation in the coal industry, in the steel industry, in a lot of other industries. Pretty soon you're talking people in the millions. So if Beijing were able to, or if Beijing chose to, tell the local governments, close all of these small, poorly performing, money losing companies, they would in a sense be saying, lay off millions of people, which then starts to affect social stability, which begin to begins to affect regime survival. So this is what gets into um, why China's uh, industry is at the current state that it's in. So I've got a couple more slides to show you. Okay, I'm not holding my mic close enough. Can everybody hear me now? Okay. A couple more slides to so show you, and then we'll move into the, the interview part. So this is what foreign automakers look at and salivate. They see this, and they see that the rich companies, as you can see at the top of the, uh, of the graph there, GDP per capita, the rich countries buy a lot of cars. It's very dense in terms of vehicles. That's vehicle density. And then down at the bottom, you see those are the BRIC countries. Um, they're poorer countries, so they buy fewer cars. But they're all trying to get rich, right? And so they're going to, at some point, so the, the foreign automakers hope, move up the scale toward where the rich countries are. So wealth drives vehicle ownership. But vehicle ownership is limited by population density. As you can see, there's a negative slope here. The other one had a positive slope. There's, so there is a negative relationship between population density and still on the left-hand axis is vehicle density. So the more dense a city is, the fewer vehicles it has. That kind of makes sense, right? You, there's just nowhere to put the vehicles. Now, you'll notice there, um, most of the cities, all of the cities up toward the top are either North, Ameri North American or West European. All of the cities toward the bottom, except for New York, which is a bit of an exception, we would all agree, are Asian cities. And the Asian cities, as you can see, among the more developed, Seoul, Tokyo, Taipei, sort of top out at around 300 vehicles per thousand people. That's about as many vehicles as one of these extremely compact Asian cities is going to hold. So there, there seems to be a limit to that. And if you've been to Beijing recently, you know what I'm talking about. If you've, if you've seen those ring roads, which during the daytime are basically just slow moving parking lots, um, there is a limit. So the foreign automakers, while they are piling into China, hoping to make a lot of money and are generally doing well, there's, they're not going to see an American level of vehicle ownership in China. It will never happen. If you've been to Beijing, you've also seen this on the ring road as well. The pollution is unbearable. Now, to be honest, uh, cars only account for about 25% of Beijing's population. The rest of it comes from the fact that they still use coal to generate a lot of energy in China. Still, 25% of this pollution is due to the number of cars here. And the Chinese are trying to do something about that. Um, they're trying to invest in electric vehicles and hybrids. Um, Warren Buffett um, was a big investor. I could talk a lot more about this. I could talk for an hour about this, but I think um, we want to get to the end um, and have a conversation with Professor Sharma and Professor Hatcher. So I'll leave it there. I'll just, I'll just say here on the new energy vehicles, um, there's a lot of investment pouring into this, but Chinese consumers are very much like American consumers. They still don't see this as a good value. In fact, they are less inclined to see it as a good value than Americans are. So about 3% of the cars in the United States now being sold are electrics and hybrids. 
Um, it doesn't even compute as a percentage in China. Th there were about 8,000 of these vehicles sold in all of China last year. Um, although last year they were supposed to have sold 500,000 of them according to the government's plans. Um, one thing China's government is learning is that you can't just, when you've got consumers who are trying to get a good value, you can't simply tell them what to do. So with that, I'll um, just go ahead and end, and we'll move into the next portion. Wonderful.